Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. When somebody asks you who your favorite number, jersey number 51 was in NFL history, who do you think of? And will they make our top 10 list? Well, Dan and Andrew Newman of Hello Old Sports are with me tonight to come up with a top 10 greatest in NFL history, all coming up in one moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. This is your host, Aaron Hayes, and we're podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron, one day at a time. So with Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff supplying us with the dunes, let's go no huddle through today's football history headlines and birthdays of Hall of Famers. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com, and welcome once again to the Pig Pen, because today we have a special football by numbers edition, and we are up to jersey number 51. We're over the halfway point, halfway there. And uh, we have some help tonight with jersey number 51, a lot of help. We have the Newman brothers. We have Andrew and Dan Newman from the Hello Old Sports. And let's bring them in right now. Andrew and Dan, welcome back to the pig pen. Thanks, Darren. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, uh, hopefully everybody's doing well. Uh, uh, COVID is uh, finally showing some relief, I think, around the country since the last time we spoke. So weather's getting nicer. So everybody should be in a little bit better spirits, hopefully. Yeah, and I think right off the bat, Andrew and I should confess to being a little bit distracted because we got the Knicks in the playoffs, and I got the Wizards in the playoffs right now, and Andrew's got the uh, the Islanders in the playoffs tonight. So uh, we got, uh, I think, one eye on the TV. So uh, just to kind of give a little caveat there. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying not to watch the Islanders because I'm a, I'm a Pens fan, so I'm not liking what the score is going right now. So, <laughs> Or the series. May so. <laughs> 26th, uh, for those listening out there, is when right. we're recording. Right. Um, well, we, we've got a, a pretty good number here, jersey number 51. Uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame is going to start us off. They have give us three names that are in Canton, Ohio, and that's uh, Jim Ringo, Dick Buckus, and Cal Hubbard. And uh, you know, three, three pretty good uh, Hall of Famers. Um, just uh, to lay it out there, Jim Ringo wore the number for 11 seasons, Buckus for nine seasons, Cal Hubbard only for one season. That may play into some effect when we uh, choose our, our top 10 here. Uh, but we can start anywhere that uh, you gentlemen like to start off with any names you want to. So I guess just real quick, um, you know, Butkus, one of the best linebackers of all time, it's, you know, some of sort of one of, you know, they always talk about Ray Nitschke and how Ray Nitschke only made, I think, two Pro Bowls in his whole career. And the reason he only made two Pro Bowls is because Dick, Buck, Dick Butkus was the middle linebacker for the Bears for all those years. And he was always ahead of Nitschke. And so that was why, you know, maybe Nitschke in his time didn't get some of the awards. So Butkus, one of the greatest players of all time, definitely one of the greatest linebackers of all time, didn't have a lot of team success in his time with the bears. I think they, I think he never made the playoffs. Is that correct? He did not. Yeah. No. Um, maybe had like one winning season or something like that. So he definitely, I think belongs. And then Ringo obviously is Ringo was kind of, you know, there's now what there's three uh, Packers in the hall of fame, offensive linemen from those sixties Packers in the hall of fame. There's Ringo, there's Forrest Greg. And then there's just very recently, Jerry Kramer Ringo was kind of he was with the team starting in the early 50s he was one of the guys that Lombardi inherited when Lombardi took over the team and so he was not on the later teams he was not on the Super Bowl teams but he was on you know the teams in the early 60s so those are both really deserving Um, Cal Hubbard is an interesting one 
he's kind of interesting for a couple reasons. He's interesting, first of all, because he's, I think, the only he's definitely the only guy who's in both the pro football hall of fame and the baseball hall of fame. I think he might in fact be the only one with the exception of um, the, there are some Negro league baseball players who are also in the basketball hall of fame based on some of the, like the, the team is in, but as far as like individuals who are in two different halls of fame for American sports, I think Cal Hubbard is the only one because he was a great player for the Giants and the Packers. And then later on, he was a, um, he was a Hall of Fame umpire in Major League Baseball. So he's an interesting story, too. I know that the fact that he only made, you know, he only wore the number for one year late in his career might affect, but he's a, he's a, you know, he's an interesting story in and of himself, Cal Hubbard. Yeah, he definitely is. And, you know, that's, uh, we've, we've talked about him on some other uh, of these podcasts of, you know, such an oddity to be a, a great football player and then, being you know an official in a totally different sport and being an all star and a Hall of Famer at that that's just uh, I don't think know if you ever see that again that's uh, quite the oddity and the other thing I think is interesting about Hubbard is that he played with the Giants for basically one season and I think his rookie year was 1927 I believe played one year and the Giants were the NFL champions that year and then he shortly thereafter decided that he didn't want to be in such a big city anymore. And so he demanded a trade to the green Bay Packers and threatened to retire if they didn't trade him to green Bay. And it's funny, that's not something that you think of a player doing in the 1920s. That feels more like something you'd see sort of, you know, from sometime in the sixties or seventies on, but you know, even all all the way back then guys were demanding trades to specific cities and threatening to sit out if they didn't get it. Hmm. I, yeah, I, I guess I didn't really realize that about him, but he was an all pro in 1927 too, his rookie year. That's mm-hmm. what's uh, re- really odd about it. So very that, interesting. That 27 Giants team won the championship and I think allowed some ridiculous number like 12 points or 18 points the whole season, which obviously was a different game back then, but even then that was pretty startling to I think all but two of their games were shutouts. And then maybe one game they let up six points and one game they let up 12. So, you know, just certainly catches the eye now, but it's not like it was commonplace then either. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. He definitely is interesting, but maybe, maybe we ought to put a, a, sort of a question mark by him, you know, that one season may play a factor in it. Cause I have a feeling we may have a, a lot of names here that are vying for that, uh, those 10 spots. Now so, let, let's go back to uh, Ringo and Buckus. Now, do you guys agree? Do we all agree that they should be on that list though right now? Yeah. And I think they'll be one too. Um, as a center, uh, I played, well, I mean, I played center growing up and in high school, I was, I was kind of glad to do this number just because it was a number that had a lot of centers that were either on the list or get considered. Um, I was, my number was in the sixties, but you know, 50 is for a long time was sort of the default center numbers were 50 to 59. Um, And looking at it, I, I, you know, I realized, Oh yeah, Ringo is, you know, probably one of the stronger number twos for any number. It's just that he's going to go up against an all time, you know, pantheon level guy. And that's one other thing I wanted to just touch on with Butkus real quick. Like my brother was talking about, about how, um, you know, he played on bad teams and, and never made the playoffs. And I think they averaged about four wins a year when he was there. It's interesting because it's sort of, to me, underscores just how the, narrative about guys winning and winning championships we tend to think of that as like an old school thing like oh it doesn't matter unless your team wins and in a lot of ways that's a modern narrative you never heard that as a slam against dick butkus you never really hear it as a slam against ted williams or you know going further back guys like ty cobb who didn't win championships and i think that says something that like yeah it's not the be all and end all dick butkus still had a you know, was one of the top defensive players of all time, even though he was never even on a team that was decent. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And if you look at Pro Football Reference, they have uh, four nicknames that uh, people referred to Buckus at. And, you know, pretty pretty uh, good for a middle linebacker to be called these names, I guess. You know, the Animal, 
the enforcer, the maestro of mayhem, the robot of destruction. You know, it's, uh, those are pretty uh, demonstrative names there for, for a middle linebacker. He was definitely from central casting. He was what sort of the image of a linebacker is, you know, and other guys like Huff and Nitschke play into that too, but even just down to the name and the team he played on, even without the winning, he, you know, if you ask, you know, somebody, Hey, name a football linebacker, you know, the Butkus might be one of the first names that comes. You, you just tend to think even like a great, like a Lawrence Taylor, you think of Lawrence Taylor, he's Lawrence Taylor. But when you think of linebacker, you just, you know, Dick Butkus is what immediately comes to mind. Yeah. And you, you sit there and you say, say about the name. Now, if somebody was telling me um, a few years ago that, uh, his name, his last name being what it is uh, growing up, you knew it had to make him tough and you know, <laughs> probably got uh, teased a little bit. And uh, yeah. I'm sure there was probably a lot of bullies that uh, wish they never said anything to him, I'm sure. So maybe you got some of that ferociousness from, from his early life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I agree with you. One and two, uh, Buckus and Ringo on there. And we'll put Cal Hubbard on standby. We'll come back to him uh, at the end if that's okay with everybody. Absolutely. Okay, what direction do we want to go to next? Now, so we're going to non-Hall of Famers, or not Hall of Famers yet, anyway. I, the next guy I would discuss is Randy Cross. Um, you know, on those, well, three of the four 80, uh, 1980s 49er teams. Um, you know, being my age, I always just kind of knew him as a guy on the CBS pregame show or a um, – you know, a TV, he did games as well. He might still do games, um, but he was one of the, you know, key guys, a right guard and a center at different points in his career for those 49er teams, protecting Joe Montana, setting up the run game. Um, you know, it was a big part of a really revolutionary offense at the time um, and has the, uh, the track record and the wins to show it, show for it. Yeah, I had him on my list. I actually had him. I had one guy before him, but I had him as my, you know, my fourth or my fifth, however you want to look at it. And started off as a guard. I think moved to center for the last couple seasons of his career with the 49ers. Won three championships. So, yeah, no, I definitely had. I think I have down here that he, he was. He, I think he made a few Pro Bowls. I don't have that right in front of me. Well, but He was a three-time first-team All-Pro. Okay, so he obviously made a bunch of Pro Bowls on top of that, obviously. A couple of second teams. It's, it's Yeah, th- three Pro Bowls and also. Three Pro Bowls, three Super Bowls, three All-Pros. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I, he was, Randy Cross was definitely, he was high on my list as well. Okay, so we're, we're in agreement that we're going to put, put Randy on there as our, our third, uh, mm-hmm. third spot on here. Okay. Now, now, Dan, you said you had somebody ranked a little higher on your, your personal list, and who, who might that be? I had Sam Mills. Okay. Five Pro Bowls. Um, he's been a finalist for the Hall of Fame a couple of times. He'll be in the Hall of Fame at some point. Started off with the Saints, and he was part of that. There was You, you tend to forget about it because they never really won anything, but there was this period in like the early 1990s where the Saints had all of these really good linebackers, guys who weren't necessarily household names, but guys like – Ricky Jackson and Pat Swilling and um, I think was Kevin Green a part of that or he might have been shortly thereafter. But so yeah, I had um, that team too. I'm sorry. Wasn't Ricky Jackson on that team too? Ricky Jackson, Ronaldo Turnbull, and um, there were a bunch of those guys. So he, uh, what was the guy? Something Vaughn as well. So there, there were a bunch of guys. So that's why I have. Then he went on to the Panthers. I believe he was on the the Panthers team that. He was on the Panthers team, I think, alongside Kevin Green that made it to the NFC Championship game in 96 in the Panthers' only second year of existence. And then I believe after that, he went on to be a coach with the Panthers for a little for a long time. Just from what I remember and what I've read, just known as like just a really good guy and sort of a football lifer, died young, unfortunately, died, I think, like 10 years ago or so and I, within the last decade. But somebody who will, I think you can almost definitely – you know, put it in the bank that he'll make it into the Hall of Fame one day. So, you know, he was the guy I had above Cross, but I think they're obviously, they're both very deserving. I had Cross for, or excuse me, I had Mills right after Cross. Um, 
I'm looking, Sam Mills passed away in uh, 2005, actually, at only 45 years old. So. Oh, wow. So he was really young when he died. And that, that's, I'm think, I thought it was more recently than that. But I remember because yeah. he had, I think it was probably, was it, a, was it a, a football related? Was it a brain injury that he had or, you know, a brain condition? Uh, no, he had intestinal cancer. Oh, okay. So he, but he, yeah, he died, died very young. And he, yeah, he was, um, he was defensive assistant with the Panthers for seven or eight years after he retired. Um, oh, and actually played a bunch of years. He was one of those guys who played a bunch of years in the USFL too. And I wonder if that, I wonder if that's hurt his, um, I wonder if that's hurt his, um, his Hall of Fame chances because he played the first couple of years of his career not in the NFL. But yeah, no, really, really good player. Um, you know, all pro, pro bowl, um, on some good teams in both New Orleans and Carolina. Well, and, and another thing I wanted to, to mention that given the subject of the show, he is one of only two players who have the number 51 retired by a team. Dick Butkus obviously has mm-hmm. retired by the Bears, and then uh, he has the number retired by the Panthers. Now, football number retiring is a little weird because some teams don't do it at all. Some teams do it unofficially. Some teams like the Giants basically stopped doing it, even though they won't acknowledge that they stopped doing it. But, um, you know, certainly a, a guy who his best year was that 96 team made a couple of other first team or a couple of second team, all pros with the saints. Um, so yeah, I think he definitely five time pro bowler. I think he's belongs on this list and, and in the top half of it somewhere. Now, now is that interesting? His numbers retired with the Panthers. He only played there for three seasons, but he played nine seasons with new Orleans and he, well, he pro- new Orleans maybe doesn't retire numbers. I honestly don't like, know. Um, and, and I think also, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ange. Also, the Panthers, um, you know, a lot of teams when they're new, they're kind of anxious to get a jersey retired quickly. So, you know, he had that all pro year, their second year, he retired after 97. Maybe they didn't retire his jersey till after he passed away, to be honest with you. But um, all of those were probably factors in, in him getting his jersey retired. Yeah, good, good points. Good points. Yeah, he was a coach with them right up until he died or, you know, until he was too sick to continue to coach. So I'm, I, he was diagnosed while he was a coach. So he was a member of the family pretty much from the day he got there as a player until the day he died. So that probably played a big role in it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think we're in agreement. And uh, Sam Mills, well, we always said that Sam Mills is our fourth one on our list here. Okay, what direction do we want to go to next? Uh, what, what player? I would go with another. The next guy on my list is another linebacker, and that's Ken Norton Jr. Um, Mine too. You know, a guy who, with the Cowboys and then with the 49ers, I believe is the only NFL player ever to win three straight Super Bowls because uh, he, he picked the exact right time to move from the Cowboys to the 49ers. So one in 92, one in 93 with the Cowboys, and then went to the 49ers, one in 94. Um, actually still has a, you know, is still a, a coach. He's been with the Seahawks for the most part for a decade. Uh, only a first team all pro one time, three time pro bowler. But um, there was a period of admittedly not long, maybe three, four years, probably not even four where he was one of the best linebackers in football. Yeah, and he was, he was definitely one of the best defensive. He probably was the best defensive player on those Cowboy teams. Cause none of those guys from what I can think of are in the hall of fame. Well, I guess Charles Haley. Yeah. Charles Haley. Haley. Yeah. Okay. So he's the second best. And then obviously went after he was gone, they had Dion, but Andrew and I talked about this on one of our episodes. I think it was actually when we did our, um, our in memoriam and we were talking maybe about when we talk about Chris Dolman, maybe, but, when the 49ers signed all of those defensive players that they signed in the 93 off season going into the 94 season, that was seen as like a really big move that the 49ers, this great offensive team, the team of young and rice and John Taylor. And, you know, before that Montana, they're finally getting serious about defense to try and get them over the hump to win a championship. And so you know, they, they signed Dion and they signed um, Dana Stubblefield, I think. But the biggest guy that they signed, the guy who was the biggest news that year was really Ken Norton because here was the best or one of the best defensive players on the Cowboys going to their biggest rivals and 
in those days, winning the NFC meant you won the Super Bowl. So his signing, maybe more than anybody else's, really kind of shifted the balance of power in the NFL that year towards the 49ers and the way from Dallas. And I, I would also just point out, for me, Ken Norton Jr. is one of two. Because I guess with Ken Griffey Jr., I knew it, and with Cal Ripken Jr. to a certain extent, but I think because it was different sports, Ken Norton Jr. and the actor Freddie Prinze Jr. were the first two guys who ever, like, I didn't know their fathers were somebody significant until my father told me that. <laughs> Ken Norton Jr., obviously, my dad said something like, oh, yeah, his, his, uh, his dad was a great boxer. And I was like, oh, wow, his dad was a boxer and he's a football player. And then with Freddie Prinze Jr., it was like, Freddie Prinze's son is an actor. And I said, Freddie Prinze Jr.'s dad was an actor. So that's, <laughs> you can feel free to edit that out. But um. uh, you're, you're making me feel old because I can remember when Norton Sr. fought Ali. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> I, think, mm-hmm. I think it was Ali knocked him out in like the first round or something. It was a, wasn't much of a fight. If I remember, if that's the fight I'm thinking of. But uh, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was a good fighter though. Yeah, so I, Norton, I think you know, maybe didn't have the longevity, even if you put the team success aside, maybe didn't have the longevity of to make him like an all time great linebacker, but for a couple of years there, he, he was, he was up there. So I think that you got to kind of weigh that heavily that, you know, he got all due respect to a guy like Sam Mills Norton at his peak was probably considered a higher, you know, closer to the top of the league than Sam Mills was. Yeah. I mean, definitely he had uh, some great significance. I, I had him on my list also at the, at the five spot, the right about where, where you guys had him. And that's sort of where it sounds like we're headed with him. Is that everybody in agreement with that? Absolutely. Okay. So we'll put him in at five. Okay. Um, what, what direction do we want to go next? So I felt like there was a little bit of a drop off here. Um, the guy I went with next is yet another linebacker. I went with Brian Cox. Okay. Yeah. Three Pro Bowls. I remember him most on the Dolphins in the 90s. And he was not, he was never a super well behaved guy. I remember him <laughs> coming out flipping the double middle finger to the fans one mm-hmm. game. I, was, I think that was when he was with Miami. Right. It was. In researching this, one of the things that I had forgotten about was that. He was one of the leaders of that of the 01 Pats, the team that won the Super Bowl. So he finally got his Super Bowl. You just you don't associate him with that team because I think that might have actually been his only year on the team, but it was. Yeah, he was his last two years. He had a year there and then a year with the Saints, and then that was it for him. So, yeah, like I said, I, I do feel kind of like after the, the, the last five that we did, sort of our top five, uh, I think it kind of there was a bit of a drop off after that. But Brian Cox, like I said, three Pro Bowls, you know, you'd be hard pressed. All of the, the really known players from the Pats defense, even just a couple years later, a lot of those guys were not on the team in 01 that 01 Patriots team the defense especially was really kind of stuck together with chewing gum so a guy like a Brian Cox I'm sure made a big difference as a clubhouse leader uh, you know a locker room leader and just an on-field leader so for that reason plus the three Pro Bowls and he was one of those other guys who you know growing up in the 90s you just knew about him because he was just he was known as a really good linebacker and uh the other thing I wanted to point out here as I was looking at this again, going back to the theme. So he was with the dolphins for five years, the bears for two jets for three Patriots, one saints, one. So five teams. And he managed to with, for four of those five teams to wear number 51. Uh, the only one he didn't was the bears, which when you think about it makes sense because it was retired. It was unavailable, <laughs> but um, you know, for a guy, and I have that for a few guys where I'm like, you know, their commitment to wearing number 51 does have to come into play here. Because <laughs> there's a couple other guys who wore it everywhere they went. So it's a kind of interesting thing. I I know I don't know if it was back uh, when when he played in the 90s, but I know now uh, when players are traded or come as free agents, they have to pay some good money to buy a number their number off of another player. And it's oh like, yeah. You know, it's like in the you know tens of thousands, twenties of thousands of dollars. It's a kind of a money maker for some of those young guys that have the number. Didn't Brady have to buy twelve from somebody when he got there, like a punter or somebody? In yeah, I think you're right. 
and I, what I read is there's also because the NFL uh, updated their their rules this year, so um, receivers and f- a few other positions are allowed to wear numbers that they uh, going in. I'm talking about for the upcoming season. Uh, are allowed to wear numbers they previously couldn't. I know single digits is a big thing for, I think, receivers and maybe maybe safeties or something like that. So you have guys now who, for the first time, can wear the number they wore in college. So I think I just read somebody on the Cowboys laid out like a pretty good amount of money to get his college number six or something like that from a different player because now he's able to wear it at his position. So numbers are big business, just like everything else. <laughs> See, what you don't know is I called a Roger Goodell up and I told him I wanted to do this series about five years from now and I needed some <laughs> new information. So uh, we worked out a deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so what do we want to do with Cox? Do we want to put him on now or do we want to uh, wait with him? What's our consensus here? I definitely have him on my list. I don't know that I'd automatically say he's six. I had him a few slots lower. I'm not saying he's not six but i think we should maybe just say he's on the list I'm concerned, he's going to be on the list somewhere six through ten but i don't know that i'm automatically saying oh he's six yeah and i'm kind of in the same place okay so so am i i think that's that's fair to say so we'll put him as our as our sixth one on our list then just for uh the sake of uh doing it all right um who, who has uh one that they'd like to talk about next so the next one i had um was James Farrier uh, with the Jets. He wasn't number 51 with the Jets. And the way I did it, I basically only counted his Steeler career because that's where he wore the number. Now he was a Steeler most of his career, had his best years with the Steelers, uh, was a Steeler from 02 to 11, was a two-time Pro Bowler, first-team All-Pro in 04, second-team All-Pro in 08, won two Super Bowls with them, um, you know, was there 10 years. Now he's in the Steelers ring of honor um, or hall of honor. Like I said, every team's got their own little thing here, but was a a linebacker on some really good Steelers defenses and ultimately some championship Steelers defenses. Certainly a guy like Palomalu deservedly got a lot more of the attention for that defense, but you don't have a defense like that and a championship defense like that and not be strong at middle linebacker. Yeah, he definitely when he came to the Steelers, he uh he he almost like was an instant fit and uh, I think uh, Dick LeBeau was the the defensive coordinator at the time and he just uh sort of captained that team right from the get-go as soon as he arrived and it was turned into a whole different defense. They had a big hole there until he came and uh he definitely filled it. Yeah, and it's it's hard to think of the Steelers as having a lull, but they kind of did from 2001 or Really like oh two oh three they they had a tiny dip they, you know they that was when they were really having issues with quarterback and then oh four was the year that um, Roethlisberger was a rookie they were the number one seed in the AFC I think that was the year LeBeau came back because I know for two years LeBeau was the head coach in Cincinnati and I think that was oh two and oh three and oh yeah, you could be right. Oh, four was the year Farrier was the all uh, first team all pro. He was the team MVP. They went 15 and one, almost got to the Super Bowl. So, you know, that was sort of he was a, uh, he was the, I don't want to say linchpin because Paul Malu was the linchpin, but he was the probably the next guy down. And with how much time later on Paul Malu missed, Farrier was, you know, a, a, a good second weapon, I guess, to have. Yeah, that, that's pretty well said. Well said. So, uh, see, I had him on my list also. Uh, you know, I just didn't want to say it because uh, I didn't want to be a homer on it because uh, <laughs> being a Steelers fan, but uh, he was always one of my favorites. You know, they called him Potsy, and uh, he really em- sort of embraced that name from the old uh, Happy Days uh, sitcom. <laughs> but uh, great, great player. Yeah, and I was, I'm, I'm good with him too. I'm. He was like one of I think like four or five guys that I had as sort of fence sitters but I'm, I'm good with having him on the list okay we'll put him on as our seventh uh, selection then for our top 10 so we've got three spots left so now is where it starts to get a little bit interesting a little bit dicey uh does anybody have any uh, players they'd like to bring up next so I, mean, I had jonathan vilma hmm. saints mostly Three-time Pro Bowler, won the title, won the Super Bowl with the Saints when they 
won their Super Bowl against the Colts in what was that 2009 season? Yeah, 2009 season was one of the guys who was uh, def- who was suspended uh, for the the Bounty Gate thing in uh, in the wake of you know a couple years after the Super Bowl season, but. Super Bowl title, defensive rookie of the year in 04, a couple of Pro Bowls, three Pro Bowls. Actually started his career with the Jets when I remember him in his early years with the Jets. So not a great player and a guy who maybe had a little bit of a, you know, something of a, you know, a checkered career with, with the, uh, you know, usually you say guys had checkered careers with their off the field issues, but he had on the field issues that got him suspended for most of a season. So, you know, I may not as good of a linebacker as some of these other guys that we've talked about, but somebody who I felt belonged in the top 10. Yeah. I did not have him on my list, but, um, you know, he came in incredibly high profile. He had been on those university of Miami teams. I actually, was at Giants Stadium the day the Jets drafted him because I was at the Giants draft party the day that uh, that was the day the Giants drafted Eli Manning. And I remember hearing a little while later, oh, the Jets just took Vilma from Miami. You know, but when you look at him from the Saints, you think about he goes there in 08. The Saints had been, they were good in 06 and they were, you know, they had a, an offense that got a lot of attention and put up points, but the defense was holding them back from really having any kind of you know, long-term potential. He comes in in 08, in 09 and 10. He's a pro bowler. They win the Super Bowl in 09. Um, You know, he was a key piece of that defense that, you know, won the Saints their only championship to date. So you can certainly make a strong case for him. Yeah, I think uh, the, just the the awards and the attention, you know, three Pro Bowls, Defensive Rookie of the Year, uh, you know, th- those uh, speak highly of a player. And I, I know we've got a bunch of other ones that uh, have some uh, Pro Bowl experience, but Defensive Rookie of the Year is kind of a special uh, uh, slot because there is a lot of defenders that are selected each year. And, uh, you know, he won it for 2004. And that was a, a pretty big draft for both offense and defense, as we just talked about, probably five or six players from and the draft. The other thing I'd say about defense, too, is to be the defensive player of the year, the defensive rookie of the year, you have to go against every position. On offense, let's be honest, they're not going to give it to an offensive lineman. They're almost certainly not going to give it to a tight end or, you know, basically it's going to be a quarterback. It's going to be a receiver. Maybe it'll be a halfback, although that gets less and less likely every year um that's a really good point i hadn't even thought of it that way so it's, it's yeah, almost it more impressive than being the offensive rookie of the year it, yeah. it is excuse me it is more impressive to, as far as i'm concerned yeah well said well said i'm capable yeah. now and then <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so, I, so i'm, I'm kind of leaning toward towards him being on that list but um you know we, we want to have a consensus or we can wait and uh you know discuss some other players before we put them on he would be number eight. Yes, he would be number eight if we put him on. You know, I'm fine with holding off for now on him. Okay. Fair enough. Let's hold off on him. And let's move on to our next player we want to talk about. I will uh, mention the next guy. Well, he's not the next guy out of my list, but he's the next guy I want to talk about. I had Jim Richter on there. Um, I'm bringing him up a little bit out of turn because, again, he was a center. He was uh, the center really starting in 1980, but he was the center of the uh, Pro Bowl Bills or the Bills team. He played center and guard for the uh, the Bills, those Bills teams that went to four straight Super Bowls, two-time Pro Bowler, 1991, 1992. Um, you know, you think about they've become a little bit of a – punchline probably unfairly but he uh you know was an offensive line staple staple of the only team that's ever made four straight super bowls you think about how many games you have to win for that you think about how many playoff games you have to win for that win to do that and also you got to open up holes for thurman thomas you got to keep jim kelly protected um so i think you know a guy with that longevity and that resume at least needs to be discussed i had him too and that offense was a, definitely a difficult offense to run. You know, we, we did an episode of our podcast about Super Bowl 25 about how, 
how difficult that defense or how difficult that offense was, not only for the defense, but for the players, because they just, you know, they didn't huddle. They ran so many plays. It had to be tough for him as a guy, you know, north of 30, having to adapt for that to that offense when it came in with Kelly in the late 80s. The other thing I noticed about him was just the longevity. I mean, starting in 1983, he played 16, 14, 16, 16, 12, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, and then 12 in his last year with the Bills. So for other than the the strike year in 82, you know, starting with after the strike year in 82, and then he got another strike year in 87, he barely played less than 16 games in a season. I think there's only one season where he missed games for an injury or missed more than one game for an injury. Plus the fact that's kind of impressive. He didn't make a pro ball until 1991. He was 33 when he made his first pro ball and, you know, made, made one again the following year. So yeah, I th- and it's funny. I, I actually thought it was Richter too, but I'm looking now at his name, and I think it might actually be Richer because it's R I T C H E R. But it, it, nonetheless, yeah, I I had him on my list too. Okay, yeah, I think he's he's definitely an interesting pick. Now, you know, th- I think the thing that kind of hurts him is you know he only had two Pro Bowls, but there were some uh, pretty good centers in the the AFC when he was playing there. I think. Uh, you know, I can think about two or three of them that were probably claiming that, that title for the Pro Bowl at that position. Um, I'm not totally sold, though, that he's on our top ten, but I think he's definitely in the discussion. I, mean, I think, I mean, I'd lean towards maybe putting a, a question mark by him and coming back to him possibly. That's yeah. fine with me. But you know, 16 seasons is definitely, you know, that's uh, and we're in at number 51 for 16 seasons. That's definitely you know, gives them some uh, a leg up on it. Okay, is there uh, another player we want to talk about here? I only had two others that I thought were worth mentioning. And so I'm going to mention Monty Coleman, who was a linebacker for the Redskins and probably one of the only guys who was a member of all three Redskin Super Bowl teams, 83, 87, and 91, each of them four years apart. I don't believe he ever really won any awards. I don't think he was ever an all-pro or a pro bowler, but I thought that the he played a long time. He played from 79 to 94, all with Washington, all wearing number 51. He was another guy a lot like, our previous Jim Richer or Richter, Richer, whatever his name was. Um, he was a guy, Coleman, who almost never played less than 13 or 14 games in a season, did lead the league in tackles in 1980. So not a star, certainly not a legend or a Hall of Famer or even a pro bowler, but a guy who started and played well for – a lot of years on a lot of good teams. So he was where I went next. Yeah, I think that's a good selection. I, I had him uh, also on my list because right? I think he's a good player. But uh, like you said, didn't have the Pro Bowls, didn't have the All Pros, but he was just a, a steady performer on some some pretty good Washington teams. Yeah, I didn't have him listed, but he certainly sounds like it's you know somebody who either – goes on the list or at the very least, you know, goes in the discussion as we get to the, the nitty gritty year. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we ought to put him on there. Cause I, I know I've got probably uh, uh, two other names that we haven't talked about that uh, may be in this discussion and may uh, cancel him out possibly. Did you want to get one of those and we'll see. I, cause I have two more as well, but. Um, and I, I only have one more. Do you, uh, well, go ahead. You guys, you guys bring the names up. I I'll bring them up if they don't get mentioned. Dan, why don't you give your last one? We'll see if there's overlap. My last one was a little more recent. I had Gerard Mayo. Hmm. Patriots 2008 to 2015 won a Super Bowl with Belichick in, I guess, would that have been his last season? In was 15? No, in 14, his second to last season. He actually didn't play that many games that year. He only played six games, but... Pro Bowler twice, All-Pro once, led the league in tackles in 2010. That was his All-Pro year. 
I think he probably played in – he would have played in another Super Bowl with – with Belichick in 11, the second team that lost to the Giants. So, you know, and I remember him just, you know, from being around and being a fan. He, he is another one who was defensive rookie of the year in 08. So, again, good player, had a couple of really good years and some mediocre years, but he was my last one that I mentioned. All right. Um, you want me to give my last two? And we can, you know. Yeah. All right. So, the one guy I had, uh, Takeo Spikes, uh, he was – in the league 13 years, wore number 51 the whole time. He managed to be number 51 everywhere. Only a two-time Pro Bowler. He's a guy who I, I guess I thought was more of a you know perennial Pro Bowler than he was. I do think it bears mentioning that the first nine years of his career were spent on bad Cincinnati and then bad Buffalo teams. So the two smallest markets in the NFL, at least at the time, bad teams, um, you know, not playing a particularly high profile position, like, you know, an offensive position or even a, you know, cornerback or something like that. Um, bounced around, was on Philadelphia, San Francisco, the Chargers, only a first team all pro one time, but, um, you know, was in the league a long time. I think it at least, you know, he at least should be brought up in terms of the list, even if he ends up not on it uh, in the long run. I agree. And that's who I was sort of referencing to when we were talking about Coleman. Uh, you know, when you have another linebacker that has a little bit of, uh, you know, awards to him, you know, with two Pro Bowls and one All-Pro, um, you know, that that sort of, uh, I don't know, it sort of makes it even par with the, the three Super Bowls that, that Coleman has because he wasn't – Coleman really wasn't an individual star – as far as the NFL looked at him, but uh, you know, he was a great, a great team player. So it's kind of an interesting discussion, I guess, if, if it comes down to those, those two being the, the last two that we choose possibly. And uh, now Andrew, you, so let, let's put him uh, on our, our list to, to talk about at the end here, if that's okay. And, uh, and you said, Andrew, you said you had another one also. I had another one to just mention looking at this, he's not going to end up on the list, but just to mention him, kind of an older player, and that was Jim Lynch. He was a linebacker for the Chiefs primarily, or started out in the AFL. He was an all-star in 1968 in the AFL, was on the team that won the Super Bowl uh, in 1970 or 1969, uh, Super Bowl IV. So, you know, second team all-time AFL. His best years were in the AFL. So probably doesn't warrant being on the list, but at least I figured I'd, I'd throw his name out uh, to be mentioned. Okay, yeah, and I yeah. had him as sort of on that cat, you know, that that plane too of somebody worth mentioning that probably wouldn't make it on. Okay, yeah, they're definitely worth worth mentioning. He's a he's an interesting one, also. Okay, uh, is that all, all all the guys that you guys have on here so far? All right, let me throw some other names out here, and I guess I'm 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 surprised one of you didn't say this. How about Zach Diossi? Here's here's one of your giants. <laughs> It has. Uh, I mean, he's got a, got a little bit of uh, some awards to him. He's got two Pro Bowls, uh, two Super Bowls. Um, good, solid player. Played, uh, you know, wore the number for quite a few seasons. So it looks like thirteen seasons, and all with the Giants. And sort of anchored that line. And there was it. I mean, he pretty much every when he was drafted, they talked about him possibly playing some linebacker. And I think, you know, first couple of years of his career, he at least practiced with the linebackers. And then after that, they were, you know, every now and then they'd make token noise. Like he was taking reps with the linebackers, but really for the last 10 years of his career, he was a long snapper. Um, that's what he did. He was the long snapper on kicks and punts as well. Was a, a good special teams player in terms of covering punts especially um he had a bit of a reputation where you know as the so the long snapper basically as soon as they snap it they release a lot of other guys have immediate responsibilities where you have to block you know in case obviously in case somebody is trying to, to block the punt he had a reputation for as he would run down the field he would scream so <laughs> he would just always draw a lot of attention to himself i don't know why he did it but he would do that um and there was a time where he was him and Eli were the longest tenure giants. He was on the team, you know, that whole time as well with Eli. Um, and 
off the top of my head, I can't come up with too many bad snaps. The, the one I remember that was bad was still a good uh, moment in the 2011 NFC Championship game in San Francisco because it was a low snap on what ended up being the game-winning field goal and Weatherford corralled it and put it down. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's purely special teams player. If, if he took 20 snaps as a linebacker in his career, I'd be surprised. Um, but, you know, there's something to be said for that. And then it was also just cool that – he gets drafted to the team his dad was a player on. His dad won a championship with them in 1990. And then he's on the team for as long as he is. He wins two championships. Just kind of a neat thing. Um, and he eventually became sort of a leader of the, on the team. He was, I think he was a captain. And so he was a, he was a team leader despite his not spending a lot of time actually on the field. Yep. Yeah, I figured he was interesting. I didn't have him in my top ten, but I thought he was interesting to talk about. And, but the uh, – the, the next person I do, I, I have on my list, and I'm uh, and this might be a dark horse to look at. How about Alex Mack? Uh, Alex Mack, uh, six Pro Bowls, uh, the Hall of Fame All 2010s team, were the 51 for six seasons. Um, you know, he's played on some uh, pretty decent lines, you know, uh, Cleveland and Atlanta, uh, you know, some decent lines that he's played on, and he's really anchored them and played well. And pretty uh, pretty stout guy, and uh, doesn't get hurt very often. So, didn't know what to, what you may think about Alex. Yeah, I think the I guess maybe I missed him because he d- hasn't worn fifty one and didn't wear fifty one until he got to Atlanta in sixteen. But yeah, three Pro Bowls in a row. Like you said, it looks like he won two, three, four, five seasons in a row. He started all sixteen games last year. He only started fourteen. So, yeah, I think that I think that that is a good dark horse candidate. As a matter of fact, I would agree with that. Okay. So we've got, uh, what we have, we have three spots left and let's go through, uh, man, unless somebody else has another name they want to bring up here before we go into our deliberations, I guess. No. So just so I can, so are we set the top five, Butkus and Ringo were one and two. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And then one. land on three, four and five in, in any kind of specific order. Uh, I think we went uh, Cross, Mills, and uh, Ken Norton Jr. Okay. Three, four, and five. And then, uh, sorry, go six, we had um, Cox. Brian Cox, and then seven, James Ferrier. Okay. So that, we, that's where we're at right now. Six, now Cox, seven's Ferrier. Okay. So just to review some of the players that we said we were going to come back to, and in no particular order, we said uh, Takeo Spikes, uh, I don't know if we want to consider Diossi or not. Um, uh, Jim Rich- Richer, um, Monty Coleman, Jonathan Vilma, and Alex Mack would be the other one. I think of all the guys I mentioned, the one that I would push pretty hard for would be Vilma. Yeah, Vilma belongs on that list the way you just laid that out. Okay. So he'll take our eighth spot. Yeah. The rest, I kind of feel like I could take or leave. And just for me to circle back to the way beginning, I just can't get there with Cal Hubbard playing one year in the number. Um, you know, I agree. He was only in what 1935. He was number 51. The, the last year he was, and it's you can tell how long ago it was because. It had a different number basically every year. Um, you know, even when he was on the same team, he had a different number basically every year because it was probably that the jersey he wore the year before had a hole in it and they weren't, they weren't budgeted to buy new uniforms until the next season. Seriously. But, but that's probably what happened. Um, uh, the way you started that off, I thought you were going to tell us he had Roman numerals on his uh, jersey or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... So anyway, that's, I just figured I'd circle back on him. I just, you know, to me, that's one year. Um, so, you know, that I don't feel strongly about either of the guys I have left, which are uh, Reichter or whatever, however we're pronouncing that, and Takeo Spikes. Um, not that I'm soured on either of them, but I just don't feel strong enough to fight for either of them either. Okay, so, well, how about how let's uh, why don't we go this way? How what does everybody feel about Monty Coleman being one of those last two spots? 
You know, I think the one that I probably, and neither Andrew or I had this, but I think the one that probably makes the most sense next to, next for me is Alex Mack. I think you made a really good point with him. Okay. That's All right, let's, let's put him on as our ninth. And uh, can you just and sort of refresh the memory on, on who's, who's still vying for number 10? All right, I'm going to take Hubbard out of contention. I think we're agreement on that. So we have Takeo Spikes. Uh, well, Diossi, I don't know if we want to keep him on or not. Uh, R- Jim Richer, Monty Coleman, uh, those four. So Spikes, Diossi, Richer, and Coleman. Yeah, that's why I... we knocked Gerard Mayo off. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot about Mayo. May- yeah, yeah. May- I'm sorry, Gerard Mayo is on there also. I don't know. I feel like to me it would either be. I mean, there's like there's longevity, and that would be uh, Richter. Or you could go sort of a couple of good years, and that would be Mayo. Or you could go a bunch of winning, and that would be Monty Coleman. Um, I guess I might just default to Coleman because of the winning, and it's not like any of these other guys did a heck of a lot. The, those Washington defenses were – those were really good defenses. So to be on those defenses for that long – and maybe you just give him a little bit of a reward because he played the same team with the same number for, you know, well over a decade. So I guess if I had to pick one, I would probably pick Coleman, but it's, I feel like you could really make a case for any of them. Well, I, I sit there and I, I, I sort of leaning towards um, Coleman also because, uh, you know, I was uh, in my, my late teens in the eighties and I, can tell you that he was sort of a household name in the NFL mm-hmm. much through the the eighties and early nineties. Uh, you know, he was uh, you know a lot more common name than, than some of the other folks that we're talking about. Maybe maybe the exceptions to KO Spikes um, of the gentleman on the left. You know, mm-hmm. R- Richer. You never whoever talks about a center not very often. Um, and um, you know, Mayo sort of a somewhat of a flash in a pan, you know, even though he was there for a few years and uh, played on a very good uh, Patriots uh, team uh, teams. Um, so I would, I would lean towards Coleman. Yeah. I, th- I think we kind of, that's the conclusion that you have to come to as much as I'd love to put either a, you know, an interior lineman or a long snapper who won two championships with the giants. And to be honest, he, not that I'm arguing for him to be on the list, but it was, as we talk about him, it's a guy again, cause he was a long snapper. I'm like, Oh yeah, he was a, like a rock for a long time. But yeah, I, I think you're right. We do have to have to go with, with Coleman in the, in the final spot. Although maybe it's close with different guys, but first among equals seems to be him. I would tend to concur. Okay. So that, uh, that makes our 10 uh, just to review them real quick here. And we said, but Buckus Ringo, uh, Randy cross, uh, Sam Mills, Ken Norton Jr., um, James Ferrier, oh, I missed a six out. Brian Cox, James Ferrier, Jonathan Vilma, Alex Mack, and Monty Coleman are our top 10 number 51s that we've uh, selected in F- NFL history. So good job, gentlemen. That was a, that was a tough one here at the end. I, I figured it might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like there was one and two were obviously, you know, in a league of their own, and then – Three through really like seven are all pretty solid. And then as you get to eight through 10, it's a little bit of certainly not mediocre. These are, you know, upper echelon when you factor in every player who's ever played in the NFL, but you know, a a clear drop off at that point. So. Yeah. It's actually, I mean, after just getting done with the, the, uh, the late forties last week, um, we, we, some of those we were coming down to punters were being considered, you know, that's how it was. Uh, there was like no names after like the first five or six names. So it was, well, it was would, difficult. I would imagine the forties too. If you, the people who primarily wore numbers in the forties play a position that really hasn't existed for 25 years at this point. Fullback. Right. Right. Oh, so it's, you know, um, but yeah, yes, full, I it was imagine- all fullbacks and DBs is what it was. So. <laughs> So, um, well, I appreciate you, you helping us out on that list. And before we let you go, uh, what do you have coming up on your podcast on the Hello Old Sports? Anything that uh, listeners can look forward to to tune into? 
So we've actually, we've, uh, we, we spent a lot of the last couple of months having guests as I apologize, cause there's a thunderstorm outside my window here, but we had, um, we've, we've had a number of guests. We got a couple of authors on to talk about some books and then we've had some different friends on to talk about some sort of different unique topics. We had uh, one friend of mine came on to talk about Boston university hockey, which is my alma mater and her alma mater. And then we had somebody come on to talk about the New Jersey nets in the nineties. And uh, we, the, the next one is going to be, we actually have a, what's probably going to turn into a three part series. They're all in the can. We did something on the, the Baltimore Orioles of the nineties and for the first episode, we had Andrew's college roommate who is, was a fan of the Orioles in the 90s, the Cal Ripken years. And so we, we talked for so long on that one that as I edit it and cut it up, that'll probably end up being two episodes. And then for our third episode on the Orioles in the 90s, we sort of uh, played with the theme a little bit and went all the way back and talked about the Baltimore Orioles team of the 1890s. So that was um, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That was a team that won a bunch of – wouldn't say World Series because it was before the days of the World Series, but won a lot of championships in the 1890s. So that's what's coming up next. I think recording next, we're doing uh, another year. We did it back at, in the fall when we first started. We did an episode on 1920, two episodes actually. And we've, we found that actually ended up being uh, one of our most listened to episodes was our two episodes on 1920. So we're doing an episode, which will probably end up being a two-parter uh, coming up that we're recording next week on 1941 in sports. So that's 80 years ago. So we'll talk about a lot of baseball, but also there was, you know, Joe Lewis was champ and, you know, had a few fights. We had the the NFL season, including the NFL. I think there was an, actually, a, there, was, there were games going on on December 7th when Pearl Harbor was bombed. So we'll talk about all of that. I think there was a triple crown winner in horse racing that year. I don't, don't remember which horse it was, but I don't need to know yet because we're not recording tonight. So I think that is, that's what we've got coming up next. And then after that kind of, you know, who knows, but Andrew, I don't know if you had anything to add there. Um, yeah, I mean, I knew the 41, <laughs> sorry, as right as I turned my head back to the screen, my brother's dog was on the screen. Oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know the 41-1 is next. We haven't really determined the running order immediately after that, but we got some some interesting ones coming up about alternate leagues, like we did one in basketball about just the various sort of, not rival leagues, but sort of different pro basketball leagues that have popped up. We're going to do ones on football from as well-known as the AFL all the way down to the, you know, the World Football League and the the ex both both iterations of the xfl and you know all of that and then sort of the gradual expansion and things like that so you know the nice thing about what we do is we can kind of just either pick a year or pick a, a team's you know and the, if we can't if we run out of ideas that's really a problem for us you know because <laughs> we can literally pick anything and, and usually do way too much time on it so <laughs> Well, it definitely sounds like some uh, great things you guys uh, have cooking up here and uh, have a lot of things in, in the cooker here. So we're looking forward to, uh, uh, sounds like a couple months worth of uh, great podcasts from, from you too. So, well, once again, I won't take up any more of your time, but I, I appreciate you coming on, uh, discussing these number 51s. And I believe you guys have uh, some more numbers uh, coming up in the, the near future. Um, yeah, I think I, I said I could do 58 maybe. I don't remember. Yeah, 58 but. you're down for is your, your next number. So we'll be talking to, to you in a few, in a 64 also you have down. So probably talking in the next few weeks with you once again. So Dan, Dan and Andrew Newman, we thank you once again and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Glad to do it. Thank you. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. 
Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.